Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on, on innovating protection along the migratory route um, and at the U.S.-Mexican border. I note that interpretation is available at the bottom of your screen, the little globe icon if you would like interpretation into Spanish and or English. We're going to begin our session with a short video from Oyeme which features the words of migrant children performed by actors by the imagination stage. We thought we would begin with the words of children and then we will close with the words of young people as well. So after the, the video, we'll begin. Advice, consejos, the journey, el camino, dear Laura, Roberto, Esteban, Valentina, be, be strong. strong. It's not easy. Don't give up. Hope. Hope. No pierdas la esperanza. Don't lose it, especially if you're alone. It's all you got. So hang on. Agarrate. <laughs> The river is deep. If you let go, don't. It will take you under. I got it, say. Remember. Remember. Recuerda. Recuerdos de tu país, de mi Guatemala linda, y su familia. Never forget them. Mi mami, mi abuela, mi papi. Their dreams for you. Opportunity. Safety. Education. Happiness. Your future. Tu futuro. Our secret American dreams. Mommy, seeing her finally, reunidos, her hands on my face. An abrazo, an embrace. Memorízalo, a thousand times. Memorize what? Your mommy's phone number. El número de teléfono de tu mami. Say it over and over again. Y no les digas a nadie, ¿entiendes? They'll use it to her and you. Remember. Friendship. Friendship. La amistad. amistad. Find a friend. Someone on the camino that you're sure you can trust. A friend. But careful. Cuidado. Está seguro que él es tu amigo. Trust. trust. He's right, man. Don't trust nobody. Only God. Mi abuela told me, climb this tree, jump, I'll catch you. I did. She let me fall. I do this to teach you not to trust everybody. Some will be good, but others will put a hand down just to pull it away. Family. Family. Familia. Familia. If you're with familia, stay close. 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 Believe them. Protect them. La familia puede ser tu mayor poder. Beware! People are going to want to hurt you, touch you, <gasps> rob you, <laughs> abandon you, <laughs> and then <laughs> you are a lost one, <laughs> una perdida. <laughs> Run! 1,450 miles! 1,450 on. miles! 1,450 on. miles! 1,450 miles! And on! Stay strong! Run! With thanks to Imagination Stage for providing us with this video clip to begin our webinar on innovating protection along the migratory route. This is the second of three webinars focused on children who make the difficult journey from Central America to the U.S.-Mexican border. The first webinar, which is available online, looked at the risks faced by children in the region highlighting innovative practices to protect children where they are. The third webinar on May 4th will look at the experiences of migrant children after they arrive in the United States. But today we're gonna to focus on that difficult journey and experiences at the US-Mexico border. And we have an impressive group of participants to speak with us. We would like to make this conversational rather than a series of presentations and to focus on some of the positive things that ways that children can be protected along this often treacherous route. Um, we do have a Q&A tab at the bottom to please enter your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we also have a, have a wonderful graphic artist, Luis Alberto Garcia, who will be sharing some of his drawings as we go throughout the webinar. We're going to begin with Rodrigo Barraza, who is co-director for the Americas 
at the Global Fund for Children based in Mexico City and has worked with migrant children and youth and women for many, many years. Rodrigo, what can you tell us about the risks facing children, primarily Central American children and adolescents, as they travel to the US-Mexico border? What particular risks do they face and what are some possible ways of mitigating those risks? Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'll be talking in Spanish, so please make sure you, you use the translation option. Uh, muchas, muchas gracias, Elizabeth, y gracias también a la Universidad de Georgetown y a todo el equipo organizado por, este, por esta invitación, por este espacio. Eh, en el corto tiempo, en el poquito tiempo que, que tengo, quiero hablar de tres cosas. ¿no? Primero, hablar de algunas dinámicas más generales que pueden explicar lo que está sucediendo en, en estos corredores migratorios eh, Centroamérica, México y Estados Unidos. Y después hablar de cómo esto se expresa, cómo esto afecta específicamente a las niñeces y juventudes en movimiento. Para finalizar, un poco hablando de qué estamos haciendo desde el Global Fund for Children, desde la organización en la cual yo, yo me desempeño, para ir desarrollando mecanismos de protección integrales. Eh, bueno, platicarles que es muy complejo, obviamente, lo que sucede en las fronteras, pero creo que podríamos hablar de tres dinámicas que están sucediendo que pueden ayudarnos a comprender un poco más qué sucede y por qué las niñeces y juventudes están migrando eh, de la manera en que lo están haciendo y en los números en que lo están haciendo. ¿no? Uno de ellos, y podríamos hablar únicamente de esto, pero solo quiero mencionarlo, es la violencia estructural. Hay una violencia generalizada, hay una violencia que se expresa de manera cotidiana y también de otras maneras, ¿no? La desigualdad económica, la falta de acceso a servicios básicos, la precarización de la vida de las, de las personas y específicamente de las niñeces y juventudes migrantes es muy evidente. Hay una evidencia que incluso muchas veces eh, viene de parte de autoridades gubernamentales, hay que decirlo. Entonces, hay una violencia cotidiana que atraviesa, que toca la vida de estas niñeces y juventudes. Eh, otro elemento muy importante es esta... Eh, está cada vez más evidente, esta vez cada vez más profunda securitización del territorio. Este territorio entendido y la migración entendida como un fenómeno de seguridad nacional, este blindaje de las fronteras, estos tapones migratorios que se van construyendo ante esta lógica de seguridad nacional que muchas veces se traduce en la criminalización y en la persecución de las comunidades migrantes, incluidas las niñeces y juventudes. Y la última, la última dinámica que quisiera mencionar es estas nuevas dinámicas que estamos viendo y que estamos intentando comprender porque están pasando en este momento, ¿no? Las nuevas nacionalidades que se están acercando a las fronteras, que están llegando también a la frontera México-Estados Unidos, eh, estas nuevas maneras de migrar, estas caravanas, estos éxodos migrantes, esta migración también colectiva, que también nos reta y nos implica pensar la protección y el acompañamiento de otras maneras, ¿no? Un acompañamiento mucho más culturalmente sensible, un entendimiento también de estas migraciones en clave colectiva que también están recibiendo una respuesta muy violenta por parte de los estados, una búsqueda de contención muchas veces violenta eh, y que también necesitamos eh, seguir analizando y seguir pensando. ¿no? Todas estas tres dinámicas, todos estos tres fenómenos se traducen en una violencia que es una violencia circular. ¿A qué me refiero con circular? Pues sabemos la migración no es una línea recta, no es que las niñas, niños, jóvenes llegan y, y ya se terminó su proceso, sino que es, es una circularidad, un continuo ir y venir, un continuo reconocerse de diferentes lugares, un continuo multiplicar sus sentidos de pertenencia. Entonces, hablamos de violencias que comienzan en el origen, que muchas veces motivan esta migración, que muchas veces se traduce en que se pueda hablar más de desplazamientos forzados y no tanto de una migración como una toma de decisión, sino migraciones muy, pre, muy precarias y forzadas, siendo estas estrategias de sobrevivencia. Comienza en el origen, pero se sigue desplegando de manera específica en todos los puntos del ciclo migratorio, o sea, en el origen, en el tránsito, en el destino, en el retorno. Vemos cómo estas tres dinámicas se expresan de manera específica y afectan específicamente a las niñeces y juventudes. Esto es muy importante tomarlo en cuenta porque los mecanismos de protección que se generen tienen que estar adaptados y también tienen que responder a estas necesidades, estos retos, a estas violencias que se encuentran en estos diferentes puntos del ciclo. ¿no? En el origen es muy evidente, ¿no? tema del desarraigo cultural que veíamos en el primer webinar que nos explicaba Hancock 
Juan José, la pérdida del arraigo cultural, la pérdida de la memoria histórica, de la memoria comunitaria que sufren estas niñas, niños y jóvenes como uno de los primeros impactos, ¿no? esta debilitación, este debilitamiento de los sentidos de pertenencia y lo que mencionábamos, ¿no? la falta de acceso a servicios básicos, la desigualdad, la violencia sexual y de género que también afecta especialmente a las mujeres y temas de despojo territorial también, eso también es que hablarlo, ¿no? Estos megaproyectos, estos, estas agresiones, estas cooptaciones del territorio también están provocando el desplazamiento forzado de las niñeces y juventudes, ¿no? Y, y obviamente la falta de alternativas económicas. Eh, en, el, en el tránsito, eh, pues también las necesidades son muchas, ¿no? Hay una, y yo estoy seguro que muchas de las personas que nos acompañan hoy van a poder hablar un poco más de esto, pero obviamente hay muchísimo, muchísima violencia, mucha criminalización por parte de los gobiernos hacia las comunidades migrantes, hacia incluso las niñeces y juventudes migrantes, pero nos damos cuenta que ellas sufren un montón de violencias en su camino, ¿no? Secuestros, extorsiones, nuevamente violencia sexual y de género, más o menos seis de cada... 10 niñas y mujeres migrantes son abusadas sexualmente en su tránsito por México, hay que decirlo, y además una gran impunidad, una falta eh, evidente de acceso a la justicia, de acceso a mecanismos de protección por parte del Estado, que sean efectivos, que sean continuados, que les permitan a ellos desarrollarse plenamente en los territorios en los que se encuentran. Esto continúa en el destino, ¿no? La desprotección en el destino es evidente, se sigue también, eh, se les sigue discriminando, hay una explotación laboral bastante importante y además, y aquí también habría que mencionarlo, afectaciones importantes a la salud física y emocional de las, de las niñeces y juventudes migrantes. El aspecto emocional de incluso llegar a un lugar, tratar de construir una vida eh, en un lugar, es muy claro, es muy evidente, es muy profundo. Y esto sigue en el retorno. Muchas veces no hablamos del retorno, pero el retorno cuando se da, sea de manera forzada, sea de manera voluntaria, también es una experiencia traumática. También hay muchos obstáculos para la integración jurídica, comunitaria, eh, en muchos sentidos, integral de las niñeces y juventudes migrantes. ¿no? Hay claras violaciones a su derecho a la identidad, por ejemplo, a que puedan acceder a documentos, a que puedan acceder a oportunidades educativas, pues justamente por, por esta falta de documentos que acrediten muchas veces eh, su nacionalidad, cuando debería ser un sentido de pertenencia múltiple, lo que hace es negarse el sentido de identidad más grande. Eh, entonces, eh, hablando un poquito de esto y hablando de este panorama, nosotros desde GFC, desde el año 2014, estamos desarrollando una iniciativa que se llama El Derecho de Ser y Pertenecer, que es su objetivo principal es desarrollar eh, mecanismos integrales de protección muy enfocado en niñas y adolescentes migrantes, enfocado en la niñez y juventud en movimiento en general, pero también muy visible este enfoque de género. ¿no? Y con varios aprendizajes que hemos tenido que no me da tiempo de, de mencionar ahora, algunas tres recomendaciones muy básicas y con esto terminaría. Es, uno, es muy importante eh, acercarnos a la protección de las niñeces y juventudes migrantes desde posturas no adultocéntricas, desde posturas que no les vean únicamente como víctimas, sino desde posturas que sin dejar de reconocer las vulnerabilidades y las violencias que sufren, sean capaces de escucharles, de reconocer su agencia, de visibilizar los aportes y, y todo lo que ellas ya están haciendo, ellos y ellas están haciendo para cambiar su situación. Están haciendo redes para conseguir trabajo, redes para generar este, oportunidades eh, de, de acceso a vivienda, están haciendo mecanismos, están haciendo estrategias muy interesantes que muchas veces simplemente toca visibilizar y apoyar. A veces pensamos que tenemos que empezar de cero, pero hay cosas muy interesantes. Lo segundo, muy rápidamente, es generar espacios de hospitalidad y de bienvenida. Es decir, no solamente pensar desde la lógica de albergue, sino pensar en espacios de bienvenida integrales donde las niñas, eh, niños y adolescentes puedan decidir cómo quieren participar, cómo quieren ser parte de estos espacios y en donde puedan recibir acompañamientos integrales múltiples, desde, desde lo legal, eh, desde también acceso a, a, a talleres para conocer sus derechos sexuales y reproductivos, poder usar el internet, poder tener espacios de recreación y esparcimiento, eso es fundamental. Y termino diciendo que lo, la tercer aprendizaje que hemos visto es que es muy importante empezar a acercar los esfuerzos que suceden a ambos lados de las fronteras. Es decir, nos damos cuenta que en el sur hay esfuerzos muy interesantes que trabajan 
por la recuperación de la memoria histórica, por la defensa del territorio, por generar comunidades eh, diversas, comunidades interculturales. Vemos, por ejemplo, que en la frontera norte, en la frontera México-Estados Unidos, hay unos acompañamientos legales integrales y psicosociales muy interesantes. Y necesitamos acercar estos esfuerzos, necesitamos generar colaboraciones que permitan crear un corredor de protección que comience cuando las, las niñeces y juventudes toman la decisión de emigrar y que se les acompañe y que siga presente durante todo su camino e inclusive en el retorno. ¿no? Nosotros acompañando a 14 organizaciones nos hemos dado cuenta que es posible que hay esfuerzos bien interesantes de este acompañamiento, donde ya las niñeces y juventudes saben a dónde llegar, saben qué esperar, qué tipo de apoyos pueden recibir, y esto facilita mucho el camino, y nuevamente, siempre escuchando sus voces, siempre poniendo sus deseos, necesidades y aportes en primer lugar. Eso sería lo que tendría para compartir el día de hoy. Muchas, muchas gracias. Oh, thank you so much, Rodrigo, for your discussion both of the violence that children experience on, en route to um, the US-Mexico border and the emphasis on the structural violence as well as gender-based violence, but also on your description of this new initiative, the right to be and belong and the importance of really looking at the agency of children and moving beyond seeing them as victims or, or objects of the attention of others. So, so thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Um, we'll turn now to Ana, Ana Saiz who's Director General of Sin Fronteras in Mexico City, to tell us about the particular difficulties faced by ch children traveling to or through Mexico. You know, wh what organizations or initiatives are working with kids and protecting children in Mexico? And what are some examples of promising initiatives that are going on? Ana. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, and thank you very much to Georgetown University especially to Gillian and, and to yourself. And it is a great pleasure for me to be here with Rodri, be here with Dana, we colleagues that we, we work together. Uh, uh, and um, so I will continue in Spanish my presentation. So um, I um, divided it in Uh, four parts. First, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, figures uh, and then the experience in Mexico for, for, for children and then the change in the law, the recent change in the law, and then some examples. So I will try to do it very, very um, uh, just as uh, adjusting myself to the time I was uh, given. So Uh, primero, eh, como sabemos, México es un país de origen, tránsito, destino y regreso de niñas, niños y adolescentes en, en movilidad. Y de acuerdo a cifras de Amnistía Internacional y UNICEF, el 30% de todas las personas migrantes y solicitantes de asilo en México son niños y adolescentes. Eh, más o menos la mitad de esos niños y adolescentes están eh, no acompañados y la mayoría se encuentran en tránsito por México y buscando una reunificación familiar en Estados Unidos. Y sí quiero recalcar esto porque creo que ahí tiene que enfocarse un esfuerzo muy importante de manera binacional. Eh, en 2014, de entre 2014 y 2019 se devolvieron alrededor de 79 mil eh, niños y niñas y adolescentes no acompañados este, y más del 50% eran no acompañados, digámoslo así. En México, las autoridades migratorias reportan que más del 90% de niñas y niños y adolescentes no acompañados fueron eh, detenidos, alrededor de 12 mil. Y se cree que eh, aproximadamente el 90% de esas niñas, de esa niñez eh, no acompañada, se necesitan protección internacional. Entonces, creo que con esto ya podemos eh, centrar un poco nuestra atención ya en, en la experiencia que sucede en México, ya eh, entendiendo un poco la, la magnitud de esta cifra. De acuerdo a Médicos Sin Fronteras, 
en 2020, el 39.2% de eh, migrantes centroamericanos reportaron haber sufrido algún tipo de ataque en México y el 27.3% eh, reportaron haber sido extorsionados. Esto sucedió durante el marco del programa MPP, todavía no estaba en vigor el título 42 en esta época y, eh, y como vemos, pues el, se, se vuelve en blanco bajo este programa los solicitantes de asilo que esperan en México. Eh, entre el 2018 y el 2019 fueron alrededor de 90 mil eh, eh, solicitantes de asilo del cual el 27.5% son menor, menores de edad. Eh, entonces, digamos, yo ahora quiero platicar un poquito de lo que pasó, porque hubo un cambio de legislación muy importante en 2021, al inicio de 2021, en enero. Antes de eso, desde 2014, la Ley de Protección a Niñas y Niños ya prohibía la detención de niñas y niños, eh, mi, mi, de, en general de niñas y niños, pero no había una homologación con la ley de migración y eso sucedía que se interpretara a que la niña es migrante, tenía una situación di diferente y el Instituto Nacional de Migración continuaba deteniendo a niñas y niños eh, sin importar esa legislación. A partir de enero de 2021, cambia la ley y se hace específico, de acuerdo a la ley de migración, que no se puede, eh, no se puede privar de la libertad a niñas y niños y adolescentes. Aquí hay un problema que sí quisiera yo señalar. La institución que protege a la niñez en México es el, eh, el, el sistema DIF, que es el Sistema de Desarrollo Integral de la Familia. Y como tal, a veces es difícil entender que los niñas y niños no tienen una institución que les protege específicamente, sino que es bajo este paraguas de la protección a la familia. Y eso a veces eh, pues impide atender ciertas situaciones que para el imaginario, para el sistema legal mexicano es difícil de entender que muchas veces las mismas personas que violentan a la niñez son parte de su familia y probablemente vienen viajando con sus violentadores y, eh, y tenemos que fortalecer, y es algo que se ha trabajado más en este marco de, 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 de la, del cambio legislativo, que es for, fortalecer a las Procuradurías de Protección a la Infancia. Tienen el problema que están otra vez dentro de la, del sistema DIF, que es el Sistema de Protección a la Familia, y a veces es un poco difícil entender ese cambio de perspectiva y entender la, la, que a veces el mayor interés de las niñas, niños y adolescentes no está permanecer con su familia o regresar a, a su familia, sino que necesitan una protección independiente. Y por más que se ha tratado de fortalecer estas figuras de las procuradurías, creo que todavía hay mucho por hacer y sigue siendo una protección muy desigual y muy asimétrica dependiendo en los, eh, en, en los estados en los que se encuentran eh, los niños y niñas. Eh, la detención de estas niñas y, y, y niños eh, en situación de movilidad humana sigue sucediendo. Nosotros visitamos las estaciones migratorias que hay alrededor de 50 a lo largo y ancho del país y seguimos viendo la presencia de niños y niñas, lo cual preocupa mucho. Eh, vemos eh, que la nueva titular del DIF está atendiendo esta situación, pero sin duda generar el cumplimiento de esta nueva ley está trayendo muchos retos al, al Estado mexicano. Entonces, entendemos que eh, esta ley dio seis meses de plazo para que se implementara a lo largo del país y todavía vemos muchos retos y, eh, y lugares insuficientes a donde tendrían que estar siguiendo todos estos niñas y niños con sus familias, porque eh, los adultos que acompañan a estos niños y niños tienen que seguir la misma suerte de los niños y no estar en situación de privación de la libertad en lo que se resuelve su procedimiento de asilo o en lo que pueden buscar alguna vía eh, para poder tener algún tipo de regularización migratoria y estancia legal en el país. 
Hay ciertos modelos eh, de cuidados alternativos que se han estado impulsando en el país. Por ejemplo, tenemos ahí todos estos CAS, que son Centros de Atención Social, eh, se les llama, y hay algunos esfuerzos que se han hecho, hay un par de CAS que ya funcionan, y los modelos han sido asesorados por UNICEF y el Sistema Integral de Protección a la Familia. Y sobre todo, eh, es importante tener esta visión, como mencionaba Rodrigo, no adultocéntrica y tratar de que sean modelos que realmente cumplan con los estándares de protección que nos marca la UNICEF o el Sistema Interamericano de Derechos Humanos, en donde no se trata de que haya... Eh, personas en detención. Creo que es importante mencionar un, el, unas recomendaciones en concreto que se hicieron a partir del Grupo de Trabajo de Centro y Norteamérica sobre Migración, que tiene ya varios reportes eh, publicados. En particular hay uno que se refiere a la protección inmediata de personas en, en necesidad eh, extrema como se, se refiere a protección humanitaria, y hay un apartado y hay recomendaciones concretas en lo que se refiere a niñez. Y esto es fortalecer las organizaciones que atienden a la niñez en movilidad, como Save the Children o eh, eh, ACNUR en, en el país, y algunas otras organizaciones locales que se deben de, de fortalecer en este esfuerzo. Y tratar también de que haya un tipo de auditoría internacional para verificar toda la auditoría o monitoreo para verificar la situación de la niñez en México. Un esfuerzo también que me parece muy importante tratar de, de mencionar es el esfuerzo que hace una organización llamada Fe y Alegría en Guatemala, El Salvador y Honduras, que se trata de incorporar a las, a las escuelas y, y, y no quiero hablar que sean solamente escuelas, sino son centros y, de, de, y programas mucho más amplios porque incluyen este, atención a la, a la comunidad, a los padres de familia, a las familias y tratar de reincorporar a los niños y niñas, sobre todo a las niñas, que está comprobado que bueno, para evitar el embarazo adolescente, para que puedan eh, también tener mejores herramientas contra las violencias de género y la, la violencia que pueden sufrir incluso en sus propias eh, casas, que puedan fortalecer su autoestima y lograr un poco más de escolarización. Eh, eh, Fe y Alegría les ayuda. Hay otro programa también muy interesante por parte de Fe y Alegría que con los maestros y maestras se, se logra detectar la niñez que puede estar más vulnerable tal vez ante las pandillas, ante las situaciones de violencia y de peligro en estos tres países y se les puede hacer algún tipo de estancia que vengan a México, a, a, han estado eh, acudiendo a Puebla en donde puedan transcurrir uno o dos años, eh, dos periodos escolares en lo que eh, pasa un poco este periodo de extrema vulnerabilidad. Uh, Anna, could, could, could I um, ask you maybe to, to wrap up? We've got some other speakers here. Thank you. Sí, absolutamente. Pues muchas gracias, Beth. Yo creo que con esto ya di los ejemplos más importantes y sigamos con la conversación. Perdón que me estaba excediendo. <laughs> no. no, thank you so much. Um, and Luis Alberto, feel free, feel free to share your screen with, um, with the card, cartoons. Um, yeah, it's really hard, I think, for people to speak about these issues in only seven or eight minutes because they're, they're so complicated. Um, um, but, 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 but thank you very much also for, for emphasizing both the risks that kids face in Mexico as well as the, um, I keep having problems with interpretation here. Um, as, as well as some of the initiatives going on. I mean, I know the, the difficulties in implementing the new law to keep kids out of detention, the problem with unaccompanied kids falling under the protection of, of a holistic program for children generally, and some of the initiatives you mentioned at the end of working more with school teachers to help facilitate the situation of children in the region. Um, so we're gonna look now at the border itself And here I'm going to turn to Ashley Feasley, who's director of the Transborder Security at the National Security Council. And 
many of us know her from her former role as former director of child protection at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Ashley, what measures does the U.S. government take to protect and care for children who arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border? Thanks so much, Dr. Ferris. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Georgetown for the opportunity to talk about this important topic. And it's a wonderful series that you all are doing. Um, and as an alumni, I'm super proud uh, for all of the initiatives you do, I think not only on the research, but also on advocacy um, and, and looking at this issue holistically. So thank you so much and, and keep it up. Um, you know, so we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, changes in Mexican law and, and what's going on there. I, I think it's really important to understand um, what the U.S. system looks like in addressing unaccompanied children. Um, you know, we have actually quite a robust series of laws um, that protect unaccompanied children and do give them, um, you know, special treatment um, separate from other vulnerable populations, in part because of their very vulnerable kind of state. Um, you know, the US government looks at this very much as a whole of government approach and looking at this issue, not only um, from what happens to children when they're here, but looking at them, how are they treated at the border at that first point of encounter with the US government and actually going further back uh, to so what some of my, my fellow panelists have talked about, what can we do to prevent them from having to make this journey? And if they do have to make this journey, what can we do to create better, safer, and, and more clear pathways? So I did wanna take a couple minutes, maybe starting from looking at that root causes, talking about the situation at the border, and then talking about what the government is doing for children who actually end up coming. Um, you know, at, in home country, I think this administration knows that looking at root causes and looking at why children are migrating is essential, but not only looking at it, but also devoting resources and, and programmatic solutions. Um, you know, the vice president has led an initiative that uh, has a particular focus on development aid, but also looking at vulnerable populations, including children. Um, in the past six months, USAID has devoted a lot of funding, not only to helping those children who have been repatriated or helping prevent children from migrating, but also looking at developmental activities, access to internet, better educational opportunities. These are all things that we continue to work on and build um, and they need to be sustained. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a renewed funding uh, since, since uh, January of 2021, but we will have to continue to see those. Um, but in addition to that, it is looking at helping to pre prepare and further expand protection systems in some of our partner countries. Um, that includes uh, most notably and most recently Guatemala and Mexico. The US government has been very involved in its work with our partners with UNICEF and looking to expand the capacity of the Mexican child welfare system and DEEF and looking at how do we expand the capacity to uh, ensure that the Mexican government can provide best interest determinations, um, which are helpful for children who are in Mexico and looking at how we can further that as a practice that is any unaccompanied child who is in the Mexican government can, can work to. So we have seen quite a bit of progress there, um, as well as looking at improving the Guatemalan uh, child welfare system. Um, you know, the work I think remains moribund, but the US government is committed to working on this. I wanna talk for a minute though, since we're talking about the border, about what the US government is doing as it relates to unaccompanied children when they are encountered at the border. Um, many of you, I think, are familiar with the laws um, that we have, but you know, under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, there is a series of protections for, for children uh, who come unaccompanied based on where they're from. Um, and the first point of contact um, for an unaccompanied child is normally the Department of Homeland Security. It's normally a border patrol or an OFO officer, depending on whether a child goes to a port of entry or is encountered in between a point of entry. Um, <clears throat> we are talking about child perspectives and the importance of children being, you know, more having more agency in this perspective. And I think 
we have worked hard within the Biden administration to understand that that can be a very, very threatening image to have a, a uniformed officer there. Um, even though many of these guys and, and girls are, are parents themselves, it's still a traumatic event. So we have worked to improve conditions and border pr patrol processing centers. We have worked to renew training on trafficking and exploitation training. And the one thing I think that is most important is we've really worked to improve the time in custody, understanding that the Department of Homeland Security is a law enforcement agent uh, agency. They are doing amazing work, but they are not child welfare experts. Um, you know, we continue to provide training. They are they are there to do the work of, of securing the border. Um, and so under this administration, we have seen a grave improvement in, in the number of hours that a child actually is in a border patrol processing center. Um, we are estimating at this time it's it's 20 hours for all of the children who are in a border patrol processing center with a particular focus on making sure that we are in compliance with the TVPRA and that children do not stay beyond the 72 hours. Um, once they are moving forward from the Department of Homeland Security, they go to the Office of the Refugee Resettlement at Health and Human Services. And this is an area where I think we are working most to recognize children's agency and at the same time their vulnerability. HHS has made, I think, great strides in making sure that we are focusing on increasing access to legal services, access to mental and health services, um, and also thinking about children as agents who were able to kind of move forward with release uh, because we know that family release that is safe and vetted is, is best as opposed to being in government custody. Um, you know, I think a couple of things that I, I would want to highlight um, that we have worked on uh, on the, the sphere of, of children in the United States and in U.S. government custody or being released is some of the improvements that we've made to actual legal pathways for unaccompanied children. Um, recently, uh, the Department of Homeland Security moved forward with uh, the decision, they're, they're currently in the process of, of working on this, to give deferred action to all special immigrant juvenile um, uh, cases um, who are in the backlog and primarily this affects many children from the Northern Triangle who are working through their immigration court case. This is a really important announcement. This is a recognition, I think, of, of the fact that we not only need to be looking at root causes, but we need to be looking at safe and legal pathways to ensure that children um, can apply uh, for legal status here once they get here. And so, you know, I, I wanna say that um, obviously the, the journey is very dangerous for children and what, what pushes them to go. I think we all have a lot of work to do, but there are you know, efforts to improve the US system that remain continuing. And there are also, I think, efforts to make sure that the children are, are seen as you know, active agents in their work, whether it's reunifying with their families or pursuing immigration relief that we will continue to uh, work and improve upon. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. I mean, it's really good to hear about some of the positive steps taking place on the border, whether it's reducing the time that kids are in custody to improving training of officials they come into contact with, um, you know, particularly access to legal services and recognizing the agency of children. Luis, do you want to um, share your, your screen again? Well, I'm sure we, we can come back to Luis Alberto and his beautiful, beautiful drawing. Um, we'll turn now to, oh, here we go. Some of the themes and ideas that have come out in these. Thank you. I think we'll look forward to seeing these two in the final version. It's really a a good addition to all, the, all of the talking we're doing. Um, we'll turn now to Gabriela Sanchez who's a researcher at the Texas A&M University in Laredo, Texas, whose research has focused on smuggling. Um, what can you tell us about the smugglers, the coyotes who arrange for children to be transported on the long journey to the US-Mexico border? 
Thank you, Beth. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. And thanks, of course, to Gillian and Georgetown. Y también muchas gracias a nuestros intérpretes, nuestras intérpretes que nos están acompañando esta mañana. Es una labor esencial la que están desempeñando, entonces les agradezco mucho el, el apoyo. Yo voy a hacer mi participación en inglés o en, en Spanglish porque estamos en la frontera. So, um, once again, thank you for, for the invitation. And I really want to, um, you know, I, I think that the, from the perspective of enforcement, from the perspective of security, you know, the, the image of the persona of the coyote, pollero, the facilitators here on the border, if we are only seeing at this dynamic from that angle, we are going to embark on this conversation of enforcement, of control, that um, facilitators of irregular migration need to be contained, need to be prosecuted because of all of the, the kind of um, offenses, you know, the kind of victimization, exploitation that they carry out along the US-Mexico border and also along the, the trajectories of people. However, I want us today to also think about this phenomenon you know, under the light of critical protection and also human rights. If smugglers exist, it is because there is a lack of equal access to visas and passports. That is what is driving the demand. Mm -hmm. that lack of equality. Mm -hmm. If you interview migrants along the migration pathway, many of them did in fact go to embassies, went to uh, consulates and applied, mm -hmm. but the requirements mm -hmm, were on, completely unattainable for them. And that was mm -hmm. at that point where they had to request the services of a smuggler. Smuggling is a form of protection from below. Mm -hmm. It's a form in which people who have who lack precisely this kind of privilege that most of us today have, you know, the ability to move, the ability to travel, the ability to go to other places with visas and passports. Um, that's, um, that is a level of protection of safety that the families of migrants and migrants themselves also want to attain. That is why smuggling also exists. It provides a very basic, very flimsy, very thin layer of protection and families invest on that. Mm -hmm. So many times we get scared when we hear that smugglers are charging thousands of dollars for, for the facilitation of a journey. And again, once we start looking at this from a, a, a perspective of, you know, from below, what it is to lack that, that critical access to protection and to safety, it is when we see how paying these fees um, negotiating with the smugglers you know, is also a critical act of love. Whenever we see you know, a child that um, on television, and I think that's something that we have seen quite often, this images, this representations of children um, that are being um, transported by smugglers or who are being abandoned by smugglers. I also urge everyone to think about all of the love that went into that child making it to that point all of the financial investments of the families, all the money that they have already invested for that child to get there. This is not an excuse, and I am not trying to justify the, the acts of smugglers by any chance, but I just want us again to think, you know, in terms of what smuggling facilitation means to the people on the ground. Again, a chance to attain a level of protection that they would not have otherwise. So once we think that way, you know, the, the dynamics also change. We are no longer driven or we are not uh, only guided by security perspectives. And that also allows us to understand why people continue to rely on smuggling facilitators and why you know, this um, engagement with risk you know, and danger you know, continues to happen, especially in the case of children. Because if we just continue blaming parents and saying that they are awful for allowing their children to travel that way, we are losing, you know, um, site again of the critical element of here is the lack of equal access to visas and passports. Um, a second aspect that I really want to um, raise during this conversation is also the role that children themselves are playing as facilitators of border um, crossings, you know, and migrant smuggling. This is a trend that has always taken place. So children, you know, people under the age of 18, have always participated, you know, exercised some degree of um, some roles in this facilitation of border crossings. 
However, it's only been as of late that um, international media has started to, to pay attention to it. But they have, um, especially again, on both sides of the border, because many times we think that the Mexican side of the border is the only one involved. Um, Sister Norma is going to, uh, I hope you soon she's going to side with me, our communities along the, the U.S.-Mexico border on the American side of the border are some of the most marginalized communities in the entire country. The levels of poverty and marginalization, you know, in South Texas, in Southern Arizona, you know, in Southern California, you know, are very high and something to keep in mind. So the narrative of security, again, if we only think of it uh, we are going to hear that the children are being recruited, you know, by transnational organized crime and primarily by drug trafficking organizations. And I am not, once again, ignoring that dimension, but I think, you know, that that makes invisible the desire and the agency of the children, the children as well. Um, for the children, again, on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, participating in smuggling is one of the very few jobs that they have available that acknowledge or in, through which they can take advantage or profit and from their social capital, of their social capital, and also their knowledge of the landscape. Mm -hmm. A smuggler is as effective mm -hmm, as you know, he, he or she is aware of um, the, the landscape and the geography you know, upon which he or she operates. Um, it's a very dangerous job, mm -hmm, and the pandemic has made you know, the, their roles even more dangerous and more precarious. Let's keep in mind that many times these children are the ones that um, generate most income for their families. They also have families of their own many times. So again, thinking about precarity and all of the conditions that they get to experience on the border. Um, there are in the country, on the Mexican side of the border, the only organization, and in fact in Mexico, the only organization who is tending to um, providing attention to um, this specific population is DIA in Ciudad Juarez, mm -hmm. um, Derechos Humanos Integrales en Acción. And with the assistance of the U.S. State Department, they have been um, carrying out efforts to restore the rights of these children yeah. once they are um, returned by CPP to their parents on the Mexican side of the border. Um, and it is important, you know, along those lines that um, I think to conclude that we think of smuggling beyond, you know, the, the narratives of security, mm -hmm. and that we also, you know, take in con take uh, very much into consideration what is the, the local context and what is happening in the lives of the children and their families. Um, and this is something that um, my my colleagues from DIA, you know, are, are uh, very much aware of the the absence of, of information, the lack of information about what children and young people are experiencing on the border makes the possibility of making their, their dynamics, you know, uh, re reduces and limits you know, those, those stages. We don't have much information about them. And once we don't listen to the children and what they have to say, we lack, you know, the paths to uh, create policy that can address, that can challenge you know, those uh, the situations that they are facing on the ground. So I think that all of us just need to be very much aware that any response that is crafted, you know, in, in any policy solution that is articulated, you know, to address some of the challenges that the children face has to put people at the center of the discussion. And we also have to keep in mind the way in which they understand and mobilize risk and safety for their own well-being and that of their families. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Gabriella and Luis, if you'd like to share your screen again. I particularly like the way that you frame smuggling in a very different paradigm than it's usually presented as a protective measure of children themselves as agents of participating in some of these initiatives to help people cross the border um, to really exercise their own agency, which seems to be a theme that's emerging in, in all of the speakers so far. Um, and, and thanks to Luis Alberto again for your beautiful and creative drawings here. That, illustrate in a different way some of the issues we've been talking about. We'll turn now to Sister Norma Pimental, who is the Executive Director of Catholic Charities of Rio Grande Valley, and who will receive an honorary degree from Georgetown next month. Congratulations for that, and, and also for your ongoing work on the border. Um, your organization has long provided shelter and welcome to migrants after they cross the border. What can you tell us about the needs of children at this stage of their journey? And, 
Can you share with us some good practices, some initiatives to address those particular needs? Welcome, Sister Norma. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to be part of this uh, panel discussion and sharing of wonderful things that are happening. I, I apologize for the noise. I'm at the airport, and so I hope that this doesn't interfere too much with the noise. But anyway, uh, I am at the border all the time, and, and I do see at both sides, as Gabriela said, the border in the U.S. side as well as the Mexican side. And presently, of course, the dangers are in both sides, definitely, uh, for families and for children. And, and uh, the, in Mexico, it, it's very dangerous, uh, extremely dangerous. Uh, families are very vulnerable and at high risk, especially the children. And so uh, the families do their best to protect their kids. They uh, go out of their way to come together and, and uh, not only the parents assist the kids to make sure they're safe and keep them protected by predators and by all those that want to harm uh, them. And so uh, what happens is that sometimes I, I hear parents say that they don't even sleep at night because they have to watch over their children to make sure nobody takes them. And, and so uh, there are a lot of spaces and opportunities for predators to take advantage and exploit and to uh, hurt children. And so it's very not safe. And so we're always working together, the different NGOs and, and churches that, especially in Mexico, that come together to try to strategize and try to find ways to keep people safe. And, and so that's a great effort that we try to do at the border, my, my uh, setup kind of fell off. So uh, let me say that, there you go, I'm okay. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So uh, I think that, that in the US side as well, we see a lot of uh, uh, um, stash houses. People, I mean, once you cross into the United States, doesn't mean that you're safe anymore, you know, but because you're in the United States, you actually will also be at risk to be taken by, by uh, traffickers or gangs that keep you st in stash houses just to make sure they can make money out of you, sell you, or, you know, uh, in, in so many ways. And, and especially young women are, are taken to be exploited sexually. And so uh, we hear this constantly and women that escape those scenarios and end up with, at our shelter, at, at our respite center and share their stories. And so, um, I think that it's very, I was very happy to hear what Ashley re reported to us and share with us of the efforts that are done by the administration. I think definitely pa uh, safe pathways for, for these families to enter and to be here in the United States without having to risk their life through a point of, between points of entry is most essential. We don't have to rely on, on policies like Title 42, whether they exist or not, to, to determine whether people should be safe but rather that policies need to be implemented that allow people to enter the united states safely and and orderly through points of entry and and make that happen and so i think that's essential and 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 i'm, I'm happy that this administration is focusing on things like that that are very important because the safety of, of the children especially and the families is very important necessary and, and uh, it's unfortunate that we we've had so many years of, of, of where there are so many policies that are only focused on deterrence and in pushing back people from entering the United States without giving it any chance of any possible legal process. And so um, I think that one of the things that also concerns me once they're in the US, you know, is how they proceed to manage uh, who is an unaccompanied child, you know. And so I find that a lot of times uh, children are not unaccompanied and they end up being unaccompanied or sent back to Mexico or to the country as unaccompanied because they come with other than their parents. And if they come with grandma, you know, it's family still. If they come with their older brother, it's family still. And they get, they get separated. I see that a lot. Or, or a child that just turned 18 on the day they, the family crossed over, they're separated. And so, uh, the effort to maintain the family together is, is so essential. And I think this administration is, is actually showing some signs of that. But I still see uh, a child separated if they immediately turn 18. And, 
through my intersection with Border Patrol, I'm able to bring that child back to the family, but it should be something that has, it's already established as a policy so that people, families don't go through that hardship of separation. And so I think that's important. I, I also see a lot of children when they're in detention or when they're placed in, in, in those child centers um, that they are depressed and, 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 and the, it affects them tremendously. Uh, and I think more attention to that needs to be placed on those, in those centers and uh, that the administration must be, uh, I'm glad that they're trying to keep them short time at the te at detention facilities, but then, then when they pass them on to Office of Refugee and Resettlement and, and they are placed in, at, at some uh, setting, even there the, the children are not happy and, and they're going through a lot of trauma and, and being there too long is not okay. And so I think efforts to, to try to minimize the times that that children are kept in those circumstances is also of great importance. So they can quickly be placed with their sponsors, with their families and, and things like that. I, but definitely uh, safety is a great concern, especially to young girls. You know, unfortunately, uh, what I see at the, at the uh, Mexico, Reynosa area, at those uh, makeshift tent uh, spaces that there's no protection uh, children kind of like are quickly to move around and try to figure out things. And sometimes they lack that, that sharpness to determine where a predator is and they can be snatched really easily or, or, and because they go to a restroom and, and thinking it's safe and it's not. And so uh, protection is of high importance for the children uh, everywhere, you know? And so that's my experience. Well, thank you very much, Sister Norma. Also for, high, and Louise, please feel free to share your screen. Um, you know, I think it's really sad to think about children who make it to the U.S. border and then face additional risks, as you said, whether it's, you know, from predators or insecurity around restrooms and so forth. And again, you see Luis Alberto's you know, powerful drawings here of some of the visual representation of, of what we've been talking about. And I note too, Sister Norma, that you also had some very specific suggestions for dealing with unaccompanied children or children who may seem to be unaccompanied but actually are traveling with a relative that isn't isn't recognized and perhaps you could think about how to improve that. Um, finally, thank you so much Dana Greber uh, Ledek, who is the Chief of Mission for the International Organization of Migration in Mexico. And IOM has kind of a unique perspective because you work in the countries of origin, countries of transit, you work in both the U.S. and Mexico. And so what can you tell us about how the needs of children vary across this migratory trajectory or their journey, if you will? And, what is IOM doing with respect to children, particularly to innovative ways of protecting them en route? Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferris, for this opportunity. Thank you to Georgetown University. It's been very interesting for me to listen to the various interventions, presentations, and information that the other panelists have provided. Um, let me start with talking about a little bit about the needs of children and to provide a little bit of context um, some of my panelists have, so I'll just complement what they've said. As we know, Mexico more and more is not only a country of origin and transit and return of migrants, but also a country of destination. And in the past couple of years, we've seen massive increases in the migration flows. In fact, in terms of numbers and migration flows, the Mexico corridor is the most important corridor uh, of migration in the entire world. Um, and so let's look at some of the actual figures, which I think are really important. According to the US government customs and border protection, uh, CBP, in the fiscal year 2020, there were almost 34,000 apprehensions of accompanied and unaccompanied minors on the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, let's compare that to 2021, where that number jumped to 149,000 apprehensions, which is a 340% increase in that one year. And then if we look at Mexico from January to November of 2021, there were almost 76,000 children and adolescents that were detained by the uh, immigration authority. <clears throat> and this represents an increase in 571% compared to the previous year of 2020. Um, of all the migrants that were apprehended in Mexico uh, last year, 25% were children. And so we're seeing 
really significant increases in the migratory flows and especially in the number of children that are being apprehended both in Mexico and the United States. Um, the main countries of origin of these children are mostly from Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, but we're also seeing quite a few children from Haiti, Cuba, um, Chile, Brazil, Venezuela, and even countries as far away as Africa and Asia. And so when we look specifically at this population, like in children, adolescents, they are exposed to multiple risks during their migratory transit. And this is precisely what Rodrigo was mentioning, um, which I'll, I'll summarize. So we're talking about arbitrary arrests, organized crime, human trafficking, exploitation. And in, in addition to this, they don't have access to health services, to housing, to education, to their legal identity documents, um, access to justice, uh, among other issues. And so these children are arriving in a very um, unstable environment and they, they really require highly specialized care. They've, they've had a lack of routine, extreme stress during their migration, which affects their development and, and affects, especially in early childhood, it affects them. And so they're arriving with fear, frustration, sadness, and this can also um, affect their behavior in terms of isolation, aggressiveness, and other behavioral ch changes. But for those of us who have exposure directly to, to these children, these migrant children, many of those on the panel, it's also super impressive to see the resilience of these children after experiencing very traumatic um, moments along the migratory route. In addition to these challenges, COVID-19 uh, has become a factor over the past couple of years that's really affected the migration experience, making it even more complex. Many shelters in Mexico have been uh, forced to close their doors um, or, or significantly reduce their spaces. And this means families have the added stress of not being sure where they're going to be able to stay when they arrive in, in cities and where is a safe space. So all of this adds to a very complex environment um, in which we are working. And so talking about shelters in a safe space brings me to, <clears throat> Beth, your question about um, what is IWIM doing for children at, at these stages of their journeys and, and some innovative approaches? So the first I want to talk about is what we're providing. It's called a filter hotel, which is basically a temporary quarantine accommodation that we're providing in two border cities um, between Mexico and the United States, one being Ciudad Juarez, which is in Chihuahua, and the other in Tijuana in Baja California. And in these spaces, we're providing like so social care for the children, medical care for them, and recreational activities and crafts. A month ago, I went to visit our filter hotel in Juarez, and I witnessed the children and their parents, those that were with um, an adult, uh, some kind of guardian, and they were doing chalk drawings and murals on the ground. And they were, um, they were encouraged to draw about their countries of origin. So they were drawing, for example, one Honduran family was drawing the Honduran flag, um, one family from Haiti with three very, very little kids uh, was drawing a, a beach scene. And so I think these type of um, psychosocial and protective environments for these children like we're providing in the hotel, uh, the filtered hotels are extremely important um, to provide them a safe space um, and to help them express themselves um, and, and to help them connect with, with their families. Another aspect that's extremely important that very few entities are doing in Mexico is helping families um, access legal identity. The right to identity is an extremely important right, and this includes, for example, passports, birth certificates. These are key for migrant children because if they don't have these, they're denied services. And so IOM is helping um, with the cost of these and also helping with a very bureaucratic, confusing um, system to be able to access these documents. We're working with the consulates in, in the border towns throughout Mexico so that families with their children, they, they can um, get these documents and so that they can access services. It's, it's really important that they have these documents. Another um, important aspect that, that we're working on in terms of migrant children is generating accurate and timely information. Uh, and this we're doing specifically for migrant children. For example, we have analysis of the situation of migrant children, specifically in the states of Tabasco, Tamaulipas, and Jalisco. And this analysis really helps local authorities, um, non-governmental organizations, civil society, other UN agencies like IOM, 
in the formulation of how they're going to uh, address this phenomenon of child migration, how to identify the gaps, what are good recommendations, what are good practices that can be replicated in other states. So this is another <clears throat> important element in terms of child migration is being able to do these studies and analysis and really identify what are the needs of these children. And then we're also on a more technical level, we're working with the Child Protective Services, um, such as Sapina in, in Spanish, to develop and improve their comprehensive protection procedures for the rights of migrant children and adolescents so that um, these child protective services can better coordinate among the various authorities uh, when it comes to protecting these, these very vulnerable populations. And then to conclude about IOM's work, um, we're, we're really aligning our work with the Global Compact on Migration, the Sus Sustainable Development Goals, of course, and working with many, many entities in the country, um, civil society, academia, uh, other UN agencies, the government, of course, on all levels. So it's really important that we're all working together to ensure these rights of migrant children. And then in terms of strategies, protection strategies that looking forward, we really need to focus on. Um, <clears throat> Anna mentioned the legislative reforms that occurred in Mexico that allowed the incorporation of international uh, standards for the protection of migrant children. That's really important. I won't go more into that, but that has helped strengthen the protection systems here in Mexico. We need more up-to-date information. IOM is, is collecting information throughout the country, but we need more specific information that can help uh, actors um, determine how they can best intervene with these, with these children and adolescents. Um, and then also several of us have mentioned the just very difficult situation for these children. They can become very traumatized. Um, they can, they've missed out on education. They've missed out on, on just being able to play. And so how to provide very immediate and comprehensive care for these children in Mexico and in the southern border of the United States um, when these children arrive in such desperate uh, situations. And then also building the capacity and, and providing trainings to Mexican authorities, um, such as child protection services, but also immigration authorities, because you cannot treat children the same as you treat adults. And so it's very important to, to build their capacity so they know how to interact with children and, and know what the correct routes are in terms of providing the appropriate response to these very vulnerable uh, children. So I'll leave it at that and, and open it up to any questions that might come up. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much, Dana. And Luis Alberto, feel free to share your screen again. But, but Dana, you covered a lot of territory in your eight minutes of conversation, beginning with the changing reality that Mexico has become a destination and not just a transit country and how that can be factored in. Um, and thanks, too, for your specific examples of the filter hotels. And we do have a question about that in just a minute. And also to recognize the documentation, those basic pieces of paper are a form of protection for children who, who lack them, and, and we need to, to, to support that. And there again, you see in Luis Alberto's drawing the sin salud, sin papeles, without health, without paper, those who are, who are affected by all of this. So, so thank you all very much. And thanks to all of you for your, for your comments and for being willing to attempt to answer complex questions in just seven or eight minutes. We have a number of questions in the Q&A, and I'll, I'll start with them. And Maybe I'll start with directing them, but feel free to jump in if anybody would like to respond. Um, Ashley, there are a couple of questions for you, which we, we might have anticipated. Um, a question here from Lisa Ledvora, um, you know, asking why every child who arrives isn't assigned a child advocate with ORR, as some countries do. And a related question about, you know, what support is the U.S. government giving to children who are returned to Mexico under the MPP migration? protection protocol. Why don't you begin, but then maybe we can bring in Rodrigo and, and Ana as well to talk about those kids who are returned, because it's a big challenge for Mexico as well. So, so Ashley. Sure. So on the issue of child advocates um, in 2012, 2013, the reauthorization of the TVPRA was the first time that the US government implemented the child advocate program formally. Um, since that time and under this administration, we've expanded uh, the program. Um, I think definitely it is something that, you know, uh, with 
available resources. There will be expansion. Obviously, it's an important program um, to help ensure that ch children have their best interests, but also have an advocate that's specifically oriented to them. So I, you know, I, I can't say enough that I think uh, that is something we are looking to expand among other protections. Um, on the issue of the Migrant Protection Protocol, um, there are currently no children enrolled in the Migrant Protection Protocol. At this time, the MPP program is focused on single adults. Um, but in terms of repatriation of Mexican children, there is a concerted effort to ensure that they um, are welcomed within the Mexican child welfare system. Um, as well as ensuring that the officers follow the TVPRA and give every child who is from Mexico, a, you know, the, a contiguous country, a full analysis of whether they are um, a victim of trafficking, whether they are of the age to consent, and whether they would uh, have a fear of return. So that is something that we have worked to improve upon, both in the in encountering um, of, of Mexican unaccompanied children and then also in the in the returns. Thank you, uh, Anna and, and Rodrigo. Would you like to comment on the issue of returning returning Mexican children or others? Um, Anna, maybe you go first, and then Rodrigo. Muchas gracias. Pues sí es un reto, sobre todo porque sí hay mucho riesgo de eh, de, de de nuevo la separación de familias, eso preocupa mucho. Y cuando se tratan de niñas, niños y adolescentes viajando eh, sin compañía de, de algún familiar o, o algún adulto, pues eh, el riesgo de que puedan llegar sanos y salvos a su destino y saber si tienen necesidades de protección internacional. Si no son eh, este, de nacionalidad mexicana, pues ahí hay que hacer un análisis cuidadoso para ver el tipo de, de protección que, que, que podrían llegar a necesitar y de no devolverlos o con sus violentadores o a un lugar donde pueda correr peligro su vida o su integridad. Entonces, como yo había mencionado en mi intervención, el sistema de, de, de protección a la familia, el sistema integral de protección a la familia, pues tiene muchas carencias y a veces es difícil eh, que puedan estar realmente protegidos y bien atendidos. Pongo un ejemplo muy rápidamente, pero tuvimos un, un niño, bueno, prácticamente un, un adulto eh, refugiado ya con estatus de refugiado que fue a, a caer a un albergue del DIF por pues por, por, por desconocimiento y demás, estaba viajando con sus amigos de 17 años, ya él reconocido como refugiado, fue a un albergue de DIF y lo devolvieron al Salvador, donde estaban sus violentadores y demás. Tuvimos que hacer un esfuerzo grande con ACNUR para poderlo regresar y, y, y poder lograr la entrada también de su hermana menor. Pero tuvimos que esperar a que el niño cumpliera 18 años para que pudiera tener su pasaporte por él mismo. Y eso fue muy complicado. Entonces, sí, para los niños y niñas sigue siendo muy difícil tener acceso a sus propios documentos de viaje, de identidad y demás. Y debería de haber procedimientos especiales garantizados eh, y más rápidos en cuestión de niñez para, para poder evitar el que estén en estos espacios inadecuados. Hasta ahí lo dejo, no sé, Rodrigo seguramente querrá complementar. Gracias, Ana. Solamente muy rápido, creo que sí, no hay que repensar. Ah, sí, gracias, gracias, Elizabeth. Eh, yo sí creo que es importante también eh, problematizar un poco esta idea de la institucionalización de las niñezes y juventudes. Pues, ¿no? Porque obviamente, y como bien decía Ana, sí es cierto que podemos encontrar casos de niñas y niños en, en, eh, en estaciones migratorias, incluso en el retorno o esperando también a ser deportados a, su, a sus lugares de origen, pero también en los retornos muchas veces se pasan por estas institucionalizaciones varias, como dice, eh, como dice Ana, a veces se hacen estos sistemas de se va al DIF, luego se va a un albergue tal vez eh, más eh, coordinado por alguna organización de la sociedad civil, luego se retorna, luego, o sea, hay un espacio en donde la verdad hay una violencia sistemática hacia las niñas y niños en su proceso de retorno que al momento que llega ya vienen muy lastimados emocionalmente, ¿no? Entonces, eh, la asistencia psicosocial, la asistencia emocional, 
no tiene que esperar a llegar a los países eh, de donde van a, a retornar a sus países en los cuales eh, estarán, sino tiene que acompañarlos en ese proceso y si sí hay que evitar, siento yo, la sobre eh, institucionalización, ¿no? porque construir espacios seguros va más allá de proveer espacios físicos o espacios de ayuda humanitaria. ¿no? Creo que, como bien de ustedes, eh, muchas de ustedes mencionaron, si hay que apostar por eh, iniciativas mucho más integrales que tomen en cuenta el interés superior de de las niñas. Yeah, it seems like some of the themes coming through are the need for these comprehensive policies, but also safe spaces for kids, whether safety through documentation or physical spaces um, at all steps on the journey. Um, there's a very interesting question by, um, by Mara Reyes that I'd like to close with, and that is, you know, what are the greatest humanitarian challenges facing kids en route? Um, but maybe before then, a very specific question from Catherine Donato for, for IOM about the filter hotels. How long will these last? How many kids are they serving? Um, yeah, in, in a little bit more detail, perhaps, about the filter hotels. Sure, thanks for that question. I'm happy to answer some of these questions. So um, in terms of the filter hotel that we have in Juarez and Tijuana, they house collectively a few hundred individuals. And so that can be families, it can be um, individuals that come uh, unaccompanied. And the amount of time um, varies depending on the situation, but the average time would be for them to go through the quarantine period, which would be about two weeks period. And there are many shelters in both of these cities that actually will not accept new um, migrants into their shelters until they have been through IOM's filter hotels. Uh, because it's very important that they arrive um, knowing that they do not have COVID and that they will not be infecting anybody um, in their shelters because many of these shelters simply don't have the means to quarantine somebody once they come. So they pay, play a key role in those two cities. Uh, in terms of how long will they be operating, well, we're hoping they will be operating until the end of the year. We potentially will have funding until the end of the year. When they were first established over a year ago, it was um, the idea was that they would just be um, operating for a few months. But as we all had originally thought when the pandemic started that it would be only a few months, now we're looking at uh, over a year, almost a year and a half that we've been implementing these and there still remains the need. And I, and I think there will, we will still have this need until the end of the year. So we're hoping that the funding will continue and that the, the support will continue to be able to um, operate the filter hotels until the end of this year. Well, thank you very much. And, and so returning to the question posed by Mara about the greatest humanitarian challenges, I'd like to start with Gabriela and Sister Norma. If your, your flight hasn't boarded yet at the airport, uh, you know, what do you see as the, the biggest challenge, the biggest potential for, for changing things for kids um, at the U.S.-Mexico border? Sister Norma, I, I see your face again, so why don't you respond and then Gabriella, and then I invite the other panelists to, to join in. I think the biggest challenge is, is, is uh, actually finding that those safe spaces, especially while they have to wait in Mexico, is, is, is one of the largest uh, challenges because they find themselves so vulnerable and exposed to, to those folk, people that are out to hurt them. And so uh, working together in a collective effort so that, the, so that everybody can participate all the different NGOs, all the different uh, international agencies for the same cause, you know, to, and, and I think that is the biggest challenge. Uh, right now in, in, in Reynosa, we're building a, a very big uh, site for, to bring everybody in. And, and uh, but even then, once we establish it, it's supposed to be open by the end of this month, uh, we need to make sure we can coordinate with different agencies to continue to offer that protection within that safe space that we are we are building. And so, working together as as all entities, UNECR, OIM, and uh, Doctors Without Borders, and even the NGOs and churches, we need to find ways to always meet and work together, and, and not just be silos in, in, in our own efforts to do uh, to do something. Yeah, those silos are everywhere, it seems. Um, Gabriela. Um, everything that Sister Norma said, so, <laughs> you know, and on top of that, I think something that she mentioned, you know, um, 
in terms of what is happening on the American side. Mm -hmm. There's there's this, most of the attention goes to what is happening on the Mexican side. And that is definitely, you know, of uh, concern. But these are groups, these are operations that are taking place by nationalists. Mm -hmm. And that are also very much shaped once again by, you know, issues that are related to poverty and inequality also on the American side of the border. So thinking about, you know, not only, you know, local solutions, but again, a, a solution that um, that addresses, you know, or that, that keeps into keeps in mind the challenges that are also being experienced on the American side. And the other one that I think that many times we will side of, um, the experiences of the children arriving at the border continue after the border. Mm -hmm. Because many times, again, there's just this emphasis on everything that is happening on the border. And, you know, many of them enter the country, you know, with the facilitation of, of um, smuggling. But after that, you know, there is all of these other gaps that need to be addressed within the United States or other countries of destination that may be trying to reach like Canada. So keeping those two factors in mind, I think, are, is also critical. Well, thank you very much. Um, there is another question that, that comes for our Mexican participants about alternative care models, foster family, community-based programs. This question from Daniela Hall Lagunas. Um, saying they've only been partially implemented in Mexico. Are they safe for children and adolescents? Are there any safety protocols in place? And then I'll give a chance for the other panelists to say something. And we, someone might want to mention the, the potential end of Title 42 a month from tomorrow, which is likely to have a major impact on the on the border. But but for Ana and Rodrigo, are these alternative foster care systems working? Okay, but uh, very, very briefly, it's complicated still because they're just at uh, a stage of, of pilots. It's only working partially. And there are some important efforts, especially in some of the, of the states in Mexico, but it's not something uh, generalized. It's something just as, as running as a, as a small pilot. And there's also Aldeas Infantiles, I know, which is a shelter that has that kind of, of arrangements in with local families. But it's only something starting in Mexico, really. I don't know if Rodrigo has another information. Yeah. OK, Rodrigo? No, no agregaría mucho. Coincido plenamente con Ana. La ley de migración se armonizó con la ley de niñas, niños y adolescentes hace muy pocos años y luego empezó la pandemia. Entonces, muchas cosas se han retrasado, pero es verdad que se están haciendo diferentes pilotos para probar ¿no? cómo salir de este, de este concepto de albergue y tener otras alternativas de cuidado. OK, I wonder if, if any of the panelists would like to comment on future challenges and what might happen with Title 42 ending and potentially larger numbers of children arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. Dana and Ashley, would you like to start? Sure, I'm happy to respond to that. That actually is a concern that we've had. Um, we're working very closely with UNHCR and UNICEF to come up with contingency planning, what this could mean. We are expecting an increase in migration flows, which already have been increasing significantly um, as per the statistics I shared. And uh, for us, also our concern is um, the capacity of the shelters, especially in the northern border. Um, and for children, that's especially a concern because most of them are not adequate for housing uh, families and for housing children. And so this is something that we've been addressing. And we have to also recognize that um, although, and, and I thought the presentation was very interesting about looking at um, smugglers as also a safe way to, um, to transport children, at the end of the day, it's a business and it's a very lucrative business. And so every time that there is a change in policy by the US government, smugglers use this as an excuse to say, now is the movement to, there now is the movement to move. Now is your time to get into the United States. Um, and so this is what we're concerned about as well as misinformation that is being perpetuated um, by smugglers so that families take the, the risky um, trip now uh, in hopes of, of going into the United States. So we have several concerns and, and we're preparing for, for this um, with other UN agencies. Thank you. Uh, Ashley, would you like to comment? Sure. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I guess the magic wand question, if we had, if, if we could do anything, one of the, the things that I uh, feel is most important is that we continue capacity building in 
in sending countries meaningful uh, capacity building, meaning not just like I said, focused on uh, necessarily uh, migration related services, but actual educational opportunity and, and access to um, economic livelihoods. Um, I think capacity also ties into the, the post Title 42 conversation pretty, pretty tightly. Um, you know, uh, we are preparing for larger numbers and, and certainly have a plan. Um, as I think everyone here knows, unaccompanied children were not subject to Title 42 under the Biden administration and continued not to have been. Um, it doesn't mean that some of the capacity concerns that you know my colleague at IOM mentioned aren't real. Um, we will continue to work to ensure that the, the system that the US government has it is robust to help ensure that children you know, are, are processed according to law, but also um, with their best interests in mind. I think something just to go back to not only capacity of making sure that children have better livelihoods in sending countries, and in the case of Mexico, a transit destination and sometimes source country, is this idea of capacity for child welfare in these countries as well. We are constantly improving our own system and, and taking uh, best practices from our domestic child welfare and foster care system. And, and you know, that takes a lot of time and resources. And for, you know, nations who have less capacity or newer starting at this, the question of making sure that they have robust systems as well is always ongoing. So um, those are constant uh, things that we, you know, I think are hopeful to, to scale up on our own and, and then with our partners. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, Luis Alberto, would you like to share your screen as we close? Um, table conversation is as Gillian said at the, at the outset. Um, thanks to our graphic artist, Luis Alberto, for putting this into a visual form. Thanks especially to our interpreters, Camila Lagos and Florencia Rodriguez, as well as to the team working with the Children's Collaborative headed by Gillian Hoopner, as well as a wonderful assortment of Georgetown and other, other students. But uh, thanks, uh, uh, Luis Alberto, for these amazing drawings. I always just stand in awe of people who can take our words and put them into to graphics like this. So, so thank you very much. Um, we're going to close now with a short audio presentation. Again, Voices of Migrant Children, courtesy of OEMA. This is just an audio um, tape, um, not, a, not a video. And so we'll say goodbye for now and look forward to seeing you again on May 4th. Thank you all very much. They pick us up at my home, mi amigo yo. They take us to a house somewhere. I don't know exactly to sleep and eat. Next is a bodega. Over 400 people there. Then we move. Sometimes we take cars. Sometimes we walk. Five days y estamos en México. Más bodegas. More walking. <clears throat> we walk in the desert for two days. We come to the wall. We climb the wall. Corremos. We run for eight hours in Texas. We get to our spot, go to a hotel, then a house. El Coyote nos lleva a Dallas. He leaves us on the street. Says he didn't get paid to guide us in the States. Se lleva nuestras cosas. Everything, even cell phones. But mi amigo hides his cell phone from the Coyote. We call and find someone to guide us to Washington, D.C. Venimos aquí en carro. My friends leave then, to New York and other cities. But I stay here. Solo Dios can help you out there. You don't want your friends and family with you porque está muy feo. You don't want to have to worry about the ones you love. When the coyote comes, it's 8 a.m. Saturday. Me llevan su carro a Guatemala. Then I go through Mexico and a river, then through canals and mountains. Another car picks me up. There are more people now. Seven. Four adults, three younger ones, 12, eight, and me. Yo estoy a cargo de los pequeños. For two and a half days, we hid in a junkyard or a car garage. A bus picks us up. We go on for 16 hours with no food, no water, no sleep. The police in Mexico stop us. They take our money. Si no le damos 500 pesos, dicen que nos van a regresar al Salvador. We go from house to house. 
The last house is in Monterrey before we come to Los Estados Unidos. The coyotes told me to walk with the two younger ones to the river. We cross and the coyotes leave us alone. It's 1 a.m. Caminamos. There's cactus and bushes, not much else. We get lost. Border patrol finds us. Al fin. It takes 25 days. No, maybe 20. Maybe a month. Se me olvida. I was with my prima who also had a primo with her, who also had a primo with him. We all cross together. We travel a long time by foot and bus. A veces caminamos toda la noche. There's not much food. Many days there's no water. We stay at many places. We were at a bodega in Mexico for three days y nadie nos dio comida. We walk for two hours before we know where to cross at the river. Eight people per raft. Sixty people cross together. Lots of children. El coyote nos da un código. We give the code to the next coyote and then to the next. Then we walk alone.